going to ramble a little bit about failure. Um, this is a common topic for startups of all kinds um, and probably large companies as well. But in particular, um, startups talk about failure quite a bit. And uh, most startups fail, so I guess that's um, apropos, apropos talking about failure in enunciation. Um, but we uh, at Entrineo, I've been here about six years, seven years, maybe longer if you count the um, informal days where we were just trying to decide if we wanted to be a company or not. Um, I've been here for all those years, and I have had and been a part of proudly numerous, numerous failures. And um, I'll say something, this isn't my idea, but this is something that you Pretty much if you read any literature about founding a business or startups or anything like that, everyone's going to say the biggest failure is failing slow. And um, they'll say this catchword is fail fast. So I actually wrote a poem about failure, and it's in my poetry book, A Roll in Bed with Honey, which is available on Amazon. That's not what we're here to talk about. So my poem is How Not to Be Really Wrong Long. And it goes, if you admit you're wrong often, you won't often be wrong long. If you aren't often wrong long, you won't often be really wrong. If you're a little wrong often, you aren't often really wrong long. And the moral of that poem is that failure is expensive, especially for startups. You're spending money on staff. You're spending time. The whole idea of a startup is to get rich quick. And if it takes a long time, well, you're just not getting rich quick. You might as well just go get a normal job. So you got to find that uh, product market fit and that scaling solution and the right mix of marketing and sales and product for your business. You got to find it fast. If you don't find it um, quick enough, you're failing slow. And so what startups often embrace, and Intrinio has a value of embracing failure, is the idea that just try it, go for it. See if it works. It's, you know, you might not know what your like a bigger company would say. Let's do you know, six months or twelve months of research and market fit analysis and talk to customers, potential customers. We'll hire a marketing company to to do surveys. You don't have time for that if you're a fintech startup. So you got to fail fast. And um, another saying that one of our advisors told me recently was that it's better to. Um, be wrong today than right in two weeks, which um, I can't claim that quote, but I definitely agree with it. And so Intrinio tries, stu- uh, tries things all the time. We try marketing approaches. We change our pricing, um, and we have been doing this for years, even changing our business model. So um, I'm just going to talk briefly today about a few of our failures and um, and kind of like uh, the way we think about failure. And For me, failure has become um, about an evolution. You're not necessarily going to be right forever like right and wrong are things that change over time like what's right for your business when it's very small might not be right for your business when it's big and we talk about scaling that way and um, if you're going to scale the thing that's right for your business that was working to get you to the last level might not scale you to the next level and so something that was right becomes wrong and something that is wrong uh, when you're small might become right when you're big. And that's a very hard concept to get used to because as humans, we just want to be right. We don't want to have to think about it. We don't want to have to change. Change is very hard. Um, so uh, one of the most important lessons that I've learned uh, in a startup life, is, besides failing fast, is that um, right and wrong are time-bound. Your company, what is right for them, might be um, not right later and vice versa. So uh, let me talk about a print mailer that we did. Uh, We literally mailed um, print cards to uh, individual households to try to get them to buy financial data from us in the very early days. Uh, I think we put an ad in a popular magazine as well. We thought, oh boy, this is going to do it. And it was uh, expensive and time-consuming um, and resulted in some very interesting marketing language. And it was a complete and utter failure. And that is not one of those things that is time out. <laughs> uh, that was just wrong, and it's. I don't think we would try it again today. Um, but thousands and thousands of people got a piece of mail from Intranio that said, hey, would you like some financial data? And I'm sure that they were all very confused. Um, and for us... Uh, we are, we the lesson was to focus on a very narrow market, and we don't necessarily have their addresses of that narrow market. Um, so maybe if that was more targeted, it would work better. Um, 
And here's a, let me give another example of something that was right for us for a while and then wasn't right later on. So in Trinio used to, in the very early days, I was in, kind of involved with HR, I run HR now at Trinio, but in the very early days, um, you know, we were just starting to have salaries and just starting to have a team and to have an office and things like that. And before that, there were no salaries and working on couches. Just when we started getting to that point, we started saying, okay, maybe we should have some HR policies. One of the very first policies that a company needs to have to attract talent is a PTO policy. And we thought we were being super innovative and creative. We said, we're going to have unlimited PTO. Cool. And then that would be a way to attract talent. And it was. In the early days, a lot of our um, our longtime employees came on when we had unlimited PTO. And that worked for a while. And one of the main reasons why it worked was that we really didn't matter what our PTO policy was when we were that small. Um, either your people are engaged and interested in working for the business and super driven and excited um, to work for you, uh, or you're going to fail it. And the PTO policy probably doesn't impact those high-performing rock stars that you need at the beginning of your business. So unlimited PTO was great for a few years. And it started to stop working in the parlance of startups. We, we would say it didn't scale. We started getting more employees and management structure and um and the new staff didn't have quite the same level of engagement. Got great, every, everybody's great, but um, you know they wanted more certainty, more understandable human resource policy for PTO. And so what we did is we actually changed from unlimited PTO to giving folks sick leave and a very generous PTO um, allotment that they earned throughout the year, which is also more common throughout the, the industry. We just gave a lot of PTO. But um, that worked when we got bigger because it gave folks more clarity um, who needed more clarity on how many days should I be taking off. Because with the unlimited PTO policy, you can kind of run in at the larger scale to this idea that, hmm, is the culture that it's unlimited, meaning you can never take it? Um, and we actually set up our PTO to... Um, a, only a small amount of, amount of it to roll over to encourage people. Yes, we need you to take breaks um, and prevent yourself from burning out. So um, another mistake that we made throughout the years was that um, a few years ago we were running a marketplace and we decided that we would try to build some software to help power marketplaces. And it was a huge idea. I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to go all over the place. There was like network effects and we would be a marketplace of marketplaces. And I've talked about um, how there's been a proliferation of financial data marketplaces. And we thought we'll create software that will um, enable anyone in maybe inside of their business to have their own marketplace. Say you run a large company, you have thousands of analysts and they need different data sets. This would be a way to kind of catalog and source and distribute those data sets. We just set to work on it. This big dip development team and, and it was a colossal failure. It didn't work. Um, we never finished it. We got going on it. And then all of a sudden, a lot of other companies started doing the same idea. Amazon is a, the, the largest competitor that's now running their own marketplace, and we realized that this wasn't really our core competency. We were a data company from the beginning. This big, flashy idea kind of distracted us, and um, and because of that distraction, it was kind of a waste of time, and we should have failed faster on it. Um, so that was another one of our failures. And then um, one of those failures that was time-bound uh, was that we started off our business selling to anybody. We would sell to individuals and students, startups, businesses, you name it. And when we were very small, we didn't have a lot of marketing presence. We hadn't figured everything out yet. Um, selling to anybody was great because you were just kind of learning who can we sell to? Who needs this data? Like what is the right pricing structure? And so for the first four plus years of our business, we sold to individuals. Well, as we got bigger, we started to realize that financial data for individuals is a really tough because they have such a small budget for data and curating and collecting and ensuring infrastructure is up and things like that is very expensive. It is uh, really challenging to run a data business where you sell to individuals. You know, in Trinio, you, know, you can license data to different folks to let them sell it to individuals, but if you're a pure data creator, uh, it's a tough, tough go to sell to individuals. So what we did at the time we pivoted. We said we'll sell our data to individuals and businesses and focus on the businesses. And 
that worked for a while because we're still bringing in some of those the high volume of lower priced individual accounts um, while you're also focusing on the smaller volume of high priced accounts but um, in recent years we realized focus was important and we realized that that was a failure again even though it was successful at the time um, <laughs> it's kind of uh, Hard to just list all your failure, failures over and over, but uh, I'll list one more. Um, when it comes to financial data, we learned the hard way that not all data sets are created equal. And this is one of the challenges of being a financial data provider is that you really can make a data set about just about anything if you want to. And when we ran a marketplace, we had hundreds and hundreds of data sets. We were adding new data sets every month, but the value of a data set is not... Um, of data sets is not even not all data sets are created equal or as valuable so as a business creating data sets that aren't that valuable is not a good business strategy and so we went wide instead of deep and what we've found over time is that that is an overextension um, kind of a distraction for us would be to say like it's better to be really good at a small number of data sets that are for uh, multiple reasons, super valuable, and they're going to be super valuable for a long time. And then to add value, keep adding um, new fields and new calculations and improving data quality in those data sets and be an expert at those and think very carefully before you add new data sets. Because um, at the time, our, our thought was every new data set, new revenue, bigger company, if you can keep growing the data sets you've got, add new data sets that sell just as well. Wow, that's an exponentially growing company. But that was a failure. We didn't um, realize, maybe naively, that um, all data sets are not created equal. So in addition to failing fast, I think the best uh, lesson that I've learned is that um, quality, not quantity, is really, really important for most businesses. There's always going to be some unicorns that get scale, with hundreds of millions of users paying a dollar a piece, but um, that is only going to be a handful of companies, and that's actually kind of a distraction for most companies. It's probably better to have fewer higher paying clients um, that um, for your business and not overextend so you can really focus on your core competencies and what you're good at.